I think some of you guys are weird. Amen. <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody, I'm just saying. But I've come to learn. I've come to learn that maybe I'm a little bit weird too. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay for weird people. I've come to learn. And you know, I was thinking um, about, it was our anniversary yesterday. Well done, Teresa, for so many years. Hallelujah. Um, 18 years we've been married. 22 years together. 18 years in perfect harmony. <laughs> The gaze across our eyes, hallelujah. But I remember one of our first dates, and we went out to the pub. And I remember having a few beers in the days I was allowed to drink. Um, and I remember spilling my beer once all over Teresa. I remember spilling my beer twice over Teresa. You see, I come to realise at the time I thought I was nervous, but maybe it was just a clumsiness in me. Maybe I was just a very clumsy person. You see, I had searched high and low, and I had found the perfect girl, and I had found her there. And my clumsiness had meant that I was, in some territorial way, staking my ground. <laughs> <laughs> the sweet smell of an Adnan's girl. <laughs> but I'd searched high and low. However, our differences meant that as we became one, and I know there'll be some Spice Girl fans in here, when two become one, Matthew, for the more biblical interview, Matthew 19, uh, 5 to 6, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. It's so important that we recognise what the scriptures are saying. As man tries to separate relationships. Just me. Anyway. As man separates God brings together in unity. A three chord strand. A mirrorism. A what? A mirrorism. Does everyone know what a mirrorism is? No. When we came back from France, we, we took on the lead pastor role of this church. We became a pastor of two churches in Launceston and in Bodmin. In time, we then became three churches as we introduced Los Wingel into the family. Then we are obviously as a church and we are part of a denomination called Elim. We are part of a global church. A mirrorism. Anyone any wiser what a mirrorism is yet? Yeah. <laughs> the definition of mirrorism is an expression using contrasting parts to indicate totality. Mirrorisms often indicate completeness. A mirrorism describes a whole thing by describing some or all parts of, and is used in two different ways. The first is through using contrasting extremes, and the second is using several, but not necessarily all, of the parts to describe a thing. The word mirrorism derives from the Greek word meromosis, which means dividing or a partition. So when I was using the example earlier that I had searched heaven and earth for Teresa, that was a mirrorism. Okay, so from head to toe is part of the body. She ate all over from head to toe. It's a mirrorism. Heaven and earth, part of the universe. He moved heaven and earth to get what he wanted. Morning and evening. Two examples in the Bible of a mirrorism. In Genesis 1.5, morning and evening. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. From Genesis the revelations, part of God's word, a mirrorism. Worship and word today is a mirrorism because what we're bringing together is God's service this morning. A church service, his bride coming together in this room 
to worship the living God. Hallelujah. To commune with him in a place. We can do this anywhere, can't we? But we choose to come to this place this morning to commune with one another and to communicate with the living God. You see, on my heart for some time has been Psalms 139. And I'm going to speak from Psalms 139 this morning. There's a merorism in this psalm, and I want to see if you guys can work out where it is. Uh, no, that's... Is, is that the second slide? Uh, 137. No, uh, 139, right at the top. Keep it going right to the top. That, that's the second line, uh, Psalms 139. Is there any others? Uh, Jai. Is there any higher ones? No, is that it? 137, that's the second slide. Okay, so something's not quite working on the sheet, that's fine. Could you find Psalm 139, please, on the yeah. Bible? This one. No, this one. Yeah, but not in the message version, just in the uh, ESV. Sorry. So just talk amongst yourselves, guys. It's a slide merism. It is, it's a merism. It's a collection of slides which creates a merism. Or a headache. <laughs> Psalm 139, verse 1 to 7. From the ESV version it says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where, where shall I flee from your presence? What a beautiful psalm this is. What we're seeing here, this is a psalm that Jesus would have probably have sung as a child. This is a psalm where the Lord is not just the Lord, but <coughs> David, the great shepherd, is saying, you, Father, are awesome. You, Father, are omniscient. You are omnipresent. You, Father, are before me. You, Father, are behind me. You, Father, already know what I'm thinking. You, Father, already know the words that I am going to speak today in this room. It's used six times in this particular scripture, the word you. God can get as me, at me and God's will is, means that he can be here at any place, at any time. And I cannot hide from him. I can't go hide in a whale. I can't even hide behind fig leaves. In fact, in, in, in uh, Jeremiah 23, 24, can a man hide himself in the secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth? declares the Lord this is a God who is everywhere and he's in this room today through his spirit Psalms 139 13 says for you formed my inward parts you knitted me together in my mother's womb God knew every move he made Two opposite sitting and rising represent all actions together. So that's a mirrorism. So where it says in verse 2, you know when I sit down and when I rise up, that's a mirrorism. God knows that. God knew not only did David's actions with, with what David was about, he also knew his motivations. So he knows David's actions, but he also knows his motivations. And in Psalms 139, 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Psalm 139, 2 to 6, talks about the daily activities of the psalmist as though they were familiar to the Lord. How many of us are familiar to the Lord today? We come to a place of worship, and I imagine some of us were in that place quicker than others. Some of us the Lord already was expecting. Some of us the Lord was already in a place where he was ready to hear what we had. Some of them he was like, hello, nice to see you. I'm Jesus, I'm God, who are you? You see, the outside isn't what God's about. 
It's the condition of our hearts that he's looking for today. But the one sample that a sample within this scripture is verse 4, the omniscience of God. Before the psalmist could frame a word on his tongue, the Lord was already thoroughly familiar with what he was about to say. The Hebrew word for here is myla. So what he's using where he uses the word here, even before the word, is the Hebrew word is myla. And the same word also literally means circumcision. So the word here, even before a word is on my tongue. So this word isn't a gentle word. This is a harsh word. This is a changing word. This is a circumcision of his tongue that is taking place in this moment. Two odd words put together, but it means that it's a harsh word being said. Even before the harshness of my words, this kind of depicts that maybe David is thinking about gossip. Maybe he's thinking about saying a bad word to someone else. But he says, even before that word, which could have been a nasty negative word, is on my tongue, the Lord knew it. He doesn't just look at your goodness, he understands our badness. I'm like, oh, is it just me in this room this morning? You see, the kind of knowledge of what David controls, it was wonderful to him. The idea that God is all controlling is wonderful to David. And I wonder how many of us feel that today, that the word wonderful, is, is, it literally means unusually good. This idea that God was controlling him was just amazing for David. In other words, the divine omniscience is too high for humans to comprehend because here is God. Here is Google, here is Facebook, trying to gather as much information about us as it can. But how many of us know that God's knowledge is far superior than any data centre in our world? God already knows the facts of 8 billion people on this planet. He already knows from the furthest corners, from the deepest hills and mountains and seas and rivers and rivers and, and desert places. He already knows everything about that person. Isn't that an incredible thought this morning? Psalms 139 brings to this place that God is already with us. But how many of us have chosen to shut the door? This is not replacement theology in the room today. This is God's love in the situation. You see, Psalms 139 says uh, verse 14 I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made say to the person next to you you are fearfully and wonderfully made and then tell them how wonderful are their works and my soul knows it very well but in contrast, we see Psalms 135. Psalms 135, verse 13 to 18 says, Your name, O Lord. In fact, let me find it in my Bible. Psalms 135. Let me read this out to you. Psalms 135, verse 13 to 18. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all of ages. Wow, well, just pause there. A God of all ages. God of all ages in this room today. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on all his servants. Just soak that up. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Today, people worship false gods. Since the beginning of time, people have worshipped false gods. 
And yet we see the absurdity of man and women to seek ultimate answers for a substitute God is just ridiculous. Because you see, who, how many of us know in this room today that we are built for worship? We are here to worship the God with a capital G. There is no such thing as a non-believing Christian or a non sorry, a non-believing human being. They are believing in something. Whether it is their football that is their God, whether it is their pub which is their God, whether it is their work which is their God, whether it is their wife which is their God. We all believe in something as our God. And yet here I am today to tell you that God is the one to worship. Everything else falls at the feet of Christ on the day of judgment. There's only going to be one football team in heaven and that's Cambridge United. (laughs) Heresy! Get behind me, See, when we turn away from God, we have made that thing our idol. <laughs> David said in Psalms 139, You know me. Just say those words, Father, you know me. You know me. Some of you are going to say that for the first time because you have built your faith on rejection. You have built it on, on values which are all negative. And yet God is here to say, I know you, child. You are mine. You are under my comfort today. Through God's omniscience, he brings unity. And he wants unity in this place today, does he not? God is lock, stock and barrel. Another merism. He is entirety. He is the glue that the unity that we need today to survive. Some of you might know this. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages. Now the word begotten there is not created. It it means literally to come into existence. Begotten from the Father before all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten again to bring into existence, not made of the same essence of the Father. Through him, all things were made. Does anyone know where that's from? The Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed. Contention in this room this morning. And yet what I've read there, I'm getting amens. It's good, it's wide. It is. You see, the Nicene Creed created in 300 odd um, by the council was basically something that all Christians should agree on. And if you want to be a Christian, whether you are Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, it is the thing that we all stand on. Go and read the rest of it if you want, at your own leisure, please do, because I'm not going to read it all now. But the Nicene Creed is truth. God is God. He has begotten. He has brought into existence this world. He has brought into existence our Father Jesus. He has brought into existence our church today. You see, some of us might think this church is man-made. But it's not. In true essence, this has been begotten by God. It is the bride of Christ. It was going to happen whether we liked it or not. Because God had already commanded it so. So when you look around this room today, some of you guys are not here by accident. Some of you guys are not here because you've just stumbled across this place. Some of you guys are not here because we serve the best coffee in this town. But not today, we're on instant. (laughs) <laughs> but you are here because he has begotten you because you have been brought into existence into this family now that's going to frazzle some of our minds here some of the theologians in the room are going to go oh that's not quite theologically correct Kevin I'm going to send you an email Steve at gateway to the life of I'm going to put the biggest complaint in I can but just think about it your presence here today is not on my charisma 
Because if it is, I'm going to spill a pint over you. <laughs> You're here today because the Lord has brought you into this place. You are in unity with one another in this place, with me and with others today, because the Lord commands it of us. You see there, a, a chap called Bill Hole wrote a book called Conversion and Discipleship, which we shared before. He talks about the six types of gospel, which is a shame it's not on the screen, but he says there are six types of gospel that human beings or Christians are trying to live by today. Here we go on the screen. He says, we all fall into one of these categories. Whether we like it or not, this is a default for us, okay? We are either a forgiveness only kind of person who believes the gospel, i.e. following Christ is optional. Um, who was I? I was talking with Izzy this morning, or was it you, Trees? I can't remember who I was speaking to. I mean, we're saying the problem is with forgiveness is we've lost sight of the power of the gospel. We've lost sight of Jesus because as Christians, we live in a place where I can sin and I know the answer. I apologize. I sin, I apologize. I sin, I apologize. It's the forgiveness gospel. Because whatever I do, I know I can go to Christ and say I'm sorry, and he has forgiven me. But that becomes too easy sometimes. It, is, it should be as simple as that, but that is no excuse for us to sin. That is no excuse for us to uh, deliberately go and do something against someone else. Then we have the left gospel, which <laughs> I'm not going to say it is. Can I say it is, it is this morning? Yeah. Again, if I offend, Steve at Gateway to New Life of Kent UK <laughs> is my email address. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the left gospel. Now, if you are, by example, a Labour supporter, then you are probably going to be more thinking on the left gospel because this is the progressive approach to society. This is those people who want to see social welfare, social being taking place, and, and the governments and, and organisations should be doing more to help our community, to put more into our community. And as churches, we should be doing more to be able to reach the social actions of our community. Then we have the prosperity gospel, where it's simply, it is given. And I prayed and I prayed, but the car I've got is not the car I wanted. <laughs> I have a lovely new car. I am absolutely blessed, Different, not but it's not the Ferrari I prayed for in January, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, my Ferrari wouldn't get through over the pothole in the car park. So he has provided me an off-road vehicle to get into the car park of church. Hallelujah. You see, there's a prosperity that says, what I ask for, it is given, which is true. But it's when it says, my God will meet my wants and not my needs. You remember this God omniscient, this God who knows me? He also knows my dark thoughts. He also knows when it's me talking, when I want to self-elevate myself above everybody else in this room today. And that's not who God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be a consumer gospel either, where it really is about social action. And, and to be fair, our church falls into this a little bit because of the Gateway Centre. A place where people come, a place where people encourage, a place where we, we lift up and we signpost. But if we're not careful, we make this place the focus. And I will not, as the pastor of this church, put the building before the cross. I will not take the cross down from the cafe. I will not stop playing worship music in there. I will not stop asking people to pray with people. I will not stop the power of Jesus seeing lives transformed in that place. Because as we know, people who are transformed create transformation in our community. Yeah. It's not the Alpha Course. It's not a messy church. It's not the church on the Sunday. It is the relationship between us. So the relationship we have with God in Psalm 139 when he says, You are wonderful, Lord. You are amazing, Jesus. I, he knows me. He knows my heart. He knows when I can become Kevin. He knows when I am uh, humble and before him. He, uh, Tracy will say, my skills are good as an administrator. I could probably run this church on an administration only. I could probably run a service. I could preach a message today, which has come from chat GBT, or whatever it's called. And you guys probably wouldn't know, but he would know. And that's the difference, yeah. is when I get to the pearly gates and he says, I loved your message that you got from AI, but what about the Holy Spirit? 
I'm the one who's got to stand in judgment there, okay? I can get away with it. I can get to Saturday evening and go, oh, okay, because that's the administrator in me. But that's not the Holy Spirit speaking. Because he still wants me to prepare. He still wants me to share and spread time, spend time in prayer and reading the scriptures. He still wants me to bring, bring a dud message every so often. Because he wants my heart. He wants my connection. He doesn't want my AI. We'll come on to that in a later day. Then we've got the right, which are, you know, the, the theological swagger. The, the right people gospel. The, the, the Donald Trump lovers. The conservative view, the traditional view people. We shan't have, I think Tiva mentioned it this morning, we can't have women preaching. We can't have children leading us in communion. We can't do that, Tiva. We're a traditional church. We're not, Bobby. <laughs> We're weird. We're weird. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. For the fact of the camera, it wasn't me who said it was Deborah. <laughs> Steve. Steve, that gateway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> God, I can't understand why we don't want to use half the gospel, half the nation, to preach the word. Effectively, we're saying that all women can't do anything, which means that we're losing half of the anointing. Yeah. It's like we would have just had worship this morning, we would have turned Sarah's microphone off and kept Matt's on. It just wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have been as powerful. It wouldn't have been as anointed. Would it? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming back next week. <laughs> Amen. Um, <laughs> kingdom. I think I've dug a hole there. But the gospel that we need is the kingdom gospel. Amen. That is the gospel where Jesus says, follow me. Now, I've come to learn that I can't get us all into that box. I can't. I can try it. I can come and say, Brian, you must do that. Deborah, you must do that. Ruth, you must do that. Lee, come on. You must do that. But... All I'm doing is getting a big stick and whacking you with it. It's the revelation of the Holy Spirit in you that says, I want to follow Jesus. And I've come to learn that each one of us fits into a different one of those boxes. It would be great if we could all be kingdom. Follow me box. In fact, it is my hope that each one of us will come into that box. However, I can, I have to accept that we are all different and motivated differently. You see, unity equals the body of Christ. Unity means that we all recognize where we're at and we bring that to the table. The true body is not about being begotten. That is not made, but it is begotten by him. New Christians and old Christians is a merorism for church. Doesn't matter whether you were on the mount with Moses or whether you've literally made a commitment last week. Jesus still loves you just the same. As we rattle through this, I'm going to miss that bit out, but there's a really interesting uh, book by a chap called Jim Collins called Good to Great. Has anyone read Good to Great? And he talks about people getting on the, uh, get the right people on the bus. He talks about getting the right people on the bus in the church, okay? He says, uh, the most popular saying in church leadership and business circles over the last few years is to get the right people on the bus. It comes from the book Good to Great. The idea is that when you're, you're selling a service or a product, you need to start with people who have the right mix of skills, emotional balance, the relational IQ, and so on. Otherwise, you'll spend all of your time in fighting instead of producing good or services and making money. You see, it sounds right. And it may work in certain bigger city churches situation when you're able to hire and fire people as you need to fit a job. But in a rural community church like us, in love, we are it. We are the guys to do what God has called us to do. And I know that God has placed some incredibly, uh, he has placed incredibly talented people here. I know that. I know that the Lord has just blessed this place. We are far and we are punching above our weight just by running this project. 
that God has brought the right people to the right place. You see, since we don't always have the ability to recruit and employ people from the outside, we have to figure these things out for ourselves. We have to figure out what the Great Commandment looks like in our text. We have to figure out uh, parts of the, the Great Commission and how that works in our context. And we have to trust that the Lord will bring the right people in to help us deliver these things. You know, this building is coming up for lease in 10 months time. And I'm not certain that this is the way forward. Because if we're going to be standing here each week just clattering in the money box and saying, come on guys, put your money in, I think I've lost sight of the Great Commission and the Great Commandments. And as hard as that is, I go back to Psalms 139. <coughs> in 1786, the chapter John Wesley wrote, uh, had a sermon called The Odd Schism. Wesley spoke of church splits in blunt terms. And he literally said in 1786, okay? So how many years ago is that? How many in the room? A lot. Mark's quick to get the calculator out. It's about 240 odd years ago, nearly 250 years ago, okay? It is evil in itself, he preached. To separate ourselves from a body of living Christians with whom we were before united. It is a grievous breach of the law of love. It is only when our love grows cold that we can think of separating from our brethren. He says to be in unity with each other is love. And you just look around the room this morning and go, guys, are we in unity here with each other in this place today? However, in the same sermon, he argues for when church separation is not only acceptable but demanded by conscience. Now remember, this is 250 years ago, so the same problems he was facing then seem to be still today. And I'm only reading what he says, Stephen Gateway. Suppose you could not remain in the Church of England without doing something which the Word of God forbids, or omitting something which the Word of God positively commands. If this were the case, but bless be God, it is not. You ought to separate from the Church of England, he preached. In that case, he said, the sin of separation would not only be on the person, but it would actually be, it would be necessitated because of the organisation's views of where they're going. Now that was said 200 odd, 40 odd years ago about the Church of England. Now I'm not going to say any more than that because I mean, you guys are clever enough. That being said, let us remind ourselves of the words of Psalm 139 in the message version, please. Really. God, investigate my life. Get all the facts first hand. I am an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say. Before I start the first sentence, I look behind me and you're there. Then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, he says, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. See, God knows it. He knows me better than I know myself. You see, this is a threat to an unbeliever. God knows all of this. If you're coming up against a non-believer today in resistance, it's possibly because he can't, he or she can't trust in the unseen. How is it possible that something as great as God, the unseen, can have so much knowledge of me? Well, let's just remind what a Wi-Fi can do. It is now the tool that many youngsters use to connect. And yet, how many of us can actually see the Wi-Fi in this room today? But we put our trust in it to receive the information. Well, maybe today is the day that we transfer the Wi-Fi to God and put our trust in his information. You see, in other words, I might be the master of disguise before you today, church, 
You see, I, I and you can conceal where we have been going this week. You and I can cover up our pasts. You and I can exaggerate what we do, how clever we are, and what we have achieved. You and I can cover our hearts' secret longings, but we cannot afford the searching gaze before the Almighty God. You know what I do, think, say, know me better than I do myself, to paraphrase. You know where I go, Lord. You have searched me and you know me. You know what I need, he says. Or I said to him. Augustus said, God who does not know the future is not much of a God. So if we have put something before a God with a capital G this morning, ask the question, does that God know the future? Does that thing or person or individual or activity know the future? And if the answer is no, then we go back to Augustine, a God who does not know the future is not much of a God. Psalm 139, 17, in summary, David says, I am an open book to you, even from a distance. You know when I leave and when I get back. I am never out of your sight. You know everything I am going to say before I've even started a sentence. I look behind me and you are there. And then ahead and you are there too. You are a reassuring presence as I come and go. And yet, Father, you love me. And as we bring this into clothes and bring this into land, I don't know if the worship guys want to just come back up, but uh, I was reminded this morning as I final preparation for messages, John 1, Nathaniel, everyone know the story of Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him in verse 45 to 49, we have found him on whom Moses is the law, in the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Launceston? In the message version. Can anything good come out of this town? Philip said to him. Come and see, Jesus. So Nathaniel coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. How could he do that? How could Jesus do that? How could he know what was going on? Because he is the Messiah. He is God. He is the shepherd of the sheep. And I'm reminded in John 10, 11, 14, as we bring this in, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who has a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, see the wolf come in and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus then says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, 